yeah. So, um, yes, I am Connor, and this is my co-lead Abdul. Abdul and, Dubey. Hey. Yes. Over the past seven or eight months, we've been um, co-leading this working group for Creative Commons on contemporary organizations archiving new media materials and cultural practices. So um, this is part of the Creative Commons Open Culture Platform, um, which has organized a handful of working groups over the past year, if you're not familiar. Um, and this is one of the ones that I happen to be co-leading. Um, the other one that I'm working on is on traditional knowledge and indigenous cultural heritage collections. Um, and I am currently the open culture coordinator at CC. And yeah, so that's kind of my introduction and the introduction to the platform and what this um, what this working group has been about. Abdul, do you want to say who you are and what you're about? And then we'll yeah, maybe just Hold a on. short one. Uh, hi everyone, Abdul Dubey here. Um, also co-leading with um, Connor. Uh, this is the only one that I'm almost part of. Um, and uh, we also jumped into the middle of this because uh, someone left and someone, and so we jumped in. Um, mm. And uh, there was a great amount of, of folks that was there in the beginning and um, due to just how tumultuous the world is these days, um, uh, we were left with not so many, but we still pulled through and pulled in the threads um, and put together um, these two interviews, um, looking a little bit more at the periphery of um, the theme that we had. And then also we put together um, a zine um, with contributions from many folks. Um, however, it was quite um, text heavy, <laughs> uh, but I think we did it justice by adding a little bit of visuality to it and also linking it to digital. Um, yeah, that's about, that's a short and sweetie. Yeah. I'm sitting in a cold ass Denmark, so um, <clears throat> give me three weeks and I'll go down south. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And I'm in, oh, just a second, good minute. Um, and I'm in Lisbon, Portugal, where it's a little bit warmer. Um, okay. So, what we're going to talk about in this session is we're going to go through. Um, the different things that we did. So the one thing that we did is we made a co-created zine, which um, we did an open call for over the summer to get submissions um, or summer, late fall, early fall um, to get submissions. So we're gonna show you guys that and kind of the different things that are included in there and give you a tiny insight into each piece, but not you know going into each one in detail. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about the interviews that we did over the fall. Um, one with a small contemporary archive in California and uh, the other interview with a uh, community-based arts event here in Lisbon um, and sort of their archiving practices as an, as an event platform. So how they, how they deal with the idea of archiving contemporary art um, for them. And then we're going to tell you how you can get the zine, because that's also something that's coming up, and um, where you can read our little report. Um, yeah. So let's um, dive in. the, um, And then at the end, we'll, do some we'll open up for questions. So if you guys have stuff you want to know more about, feel free to jump in then. Um, or if it's something really exciting that you want to ask, at some point in the middle, feel free to just uh, raise your hand with the little zoom button for it, and I'd be happy to bring you up. Um, so our zine, uh, like I said, it consists of seven submissions. This is the digital one that I have here. Um, I also have a printed one. So we've got, oh, it blurs. Okay, there. I also have a printed one. Um, so seven submissions, um, all kind of on the topic of contemporary organizations archiving new media. And we had, we, we didn't do any uh, selection after we got the submission. So it wasn't, we, we left it quite open and are not taking any 
credit for the for the individual submissions it's more like we made the platform so that more people or a variety of contributions could have space um yes so these are the names of the pieces that have been submitted on our second page here um but let's just dive in a bit as abdul mentioned it was quite text heavy so it gets um it was a bit of a creative challenge to figure out how do we make it how do we make this creative thing a bit um engaging when it is a lot of text there's a lot of papers and stuff like that so we tried to um still keep it in the in the feeling of a zine by putting these blocks of text in there um this article constituting an archive is a paper about the definitions of an inclusive archive so the writer talks about um discusses an african and asian diaspora archive in the u.s and um, at least in this first section, he dives into the uh, what literally those words mean and how they are defined and used for this archive. And that's kind of the introduction to um, modernizing the idea of an archive and what what gets included and where the where the barriers are and what the what the sort of frames of an archive can be. Oh, I forgot yeah, to and important to mention here, I mean, Stuart uh, Hall, uh, amazing. Um, as a now an ancestor to many to many working out there, and um, this article really lays down some some framework for anyone really thinking of um, creating archives, also holding um, a more deep in your um, headspace roots, um, because the archive always conjures up really. Um, ancient uh, gatekeeping type of images to many. And here the article really kind of explores um, these alternative ways and making sure that language um, and also holding very much to what Stuart really um, put into uh, work here is kind of low theory and not uh, blowing people's brains out by using big words. Um, so it was really amazing that this came up through um, the contributions. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, I just wanted to also say that the full text is not in the PDF or in the printed zine. So uh, that's something that Abdul kind of mentioned in the beginning. There's a um, there's a QR code here on the oh not on this one. Um, it's on in the printed one. Yeah, in the contents page there is. Uh... You can't see it. It's not there. There's the QR code. So that opens a file folder where all the um where all the full texts are um because like we said it's it's quite text heavy so instead of it just being a book um we kept it a bit shorter and made it a bit more collagey so that you go into the digital space to see the full text anyway yeah. <laughs> moving on our second uh contribution was this transcript from an interview um from so the interview is with a woman named Hattie Leeper um she was the first african-american woman um to host a radio show in charlotte north carolina south carolina um so the conversation is mostly about her um her origin story in a way so how she got into it the work that she does and what what the relevance was um what her role meant for her community um as a voice um, on public radio. And there is a small foundation um, that is dedicated to, to her uh, recordings because it was a public radio station. All the recordings were saved and they've created this digital archive with um, transcripts and um, uh, the recordings so that you can browse them. And this is one of the submissions that we got. So her interview is in here as well as the audio. So in the in the file um, that I mentioned, the audio recording is in there as well. Abdul, do you want to add anything to that one? No, I mean, just to say that Hadi is an absolute legend uh, and this transcript and both the audio is well worth it to, um, to take a read and also to take a listen. Uh, they pioneered a space for other voices, um, you know, in a time in the United States where 
everything was kind of white only and and mm -hmm. here was a here was a woman that was standing ground and making sure that other people also get heard and so um this audio in a way um is really amazing that we that we were able to get it i then also did a little bit of searching around um to find imagery and find elements about um hattie and uh, they got awarded a really prestigious award for their lifetime's work um mm -hmm. and um, the interviewers here is also just really taking their time and having a really um it's, it's a very intimate conversation and you know mm -hmm. jumping around uh, timelines um so i definitely recommend that you read it um yeah. yeah yeah i think it's about an hour so it's quite it's quite in depth exactly then um this next section is a zine within a zine so we i'll go to this page so you can actually see it um this zine was sent to us um which is about um a website called mouchette.org if you're not familiar with it i highly recommend checking it out um and this forward kind of introduces what it's all about um mouchette.org is is um an early internet website that has kind of stood the test of time um, and been maintained completely anonymously. It's still, um, it's a permanent fixture online, but nobody knows who's behind it. It's remained um, unknown since it was created in the 90s, 96 actually, it says it right here, 96. Yeah, 96 to be exact. Yeah, so it's really, really early internet stuff that, um, this is all about and the p the website is often described as a piece of art it's considered a piece of art it's gone to exhibitions and um been cataloged in museums and stuff like that because of its uniqueness and the kind of message that it sends um yeah it's quite an interesting thing as i said it's a zine so uh if you go into the folder you can see the whole zine which is i think about 30 pages with um, excerpts from the website itself, but also some articles about people's first experiences with the website and how they found it um, and what people have experienced going through it, because it's also very engaging for something that's from the 90s. Back in the back at that time, a lot of that stuff was obviously just very text based and not um, it didn't have this same uh, interactivity that we're used to now, but this particular example actually does. It's um, uh, alive in a way. It was using hyperlinks before people were really using hyperlinks. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just that the HTML was, or the earlier language was really, I think very significant that it's still standing its ground um, and uh, a testament to uh, the digital archiving in, in its own, own right. Yeah. Precisely. Um, yeah. And this zine within a zine is kind of a dedication to that. Our next submission is called Querying the Catalog, Queer Theory and the Politics of Correction. Um, this is an article that dives into the ideas of trying to um, change the language for categorization in broad strokes. That's what it's about. Um, they, the writer dives into how it can be approached and where does it come from? Where does the idea of uh, changing categorizations come from, especially from a queer perspective? And um, it's kind of a history lesson um, where they talk about uh, basically these, uh, what did they say? They said activist librarians activist librarians diving into um, how uh, cataloging is representative and inclusive and um, yeah but it's very academic at the same time so it's, it's yeah and just maybe one one little uh, addition here um, uh, is to know that from a queer point of view uh, library technologies especially within the cataloging um, some libraries have maybe changed, but they're still using this Dewey system. Um, and to find anything 
that um, so, so, that gives you an idea of how our world actually works right now is totally excluded. So mm -hmm. um, the jury system was also again made within the United States and, and in a time where uh, segregation um, was rife. And so mm -hmm. this very uh, <laughs> this very weird way of um, presenting knowledge in a public space is is what the writer is really um, challenging here, and also bringing out um, some very problematic ways in how the system is still um, the, the number one classification system within libraries. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially when it comes to like you know finding finding work within queer theory or a, a critical race theory, like you won't be able to find these things because um, the Dewey mm -hmm. system, um, in a way, kind of works against um, these yeah. aspects. So here's a very in depth and very uh, great look. I think what what has happened here in the zine is is that you're getting um, these seven contributors um, is giving a really good uh, grounding for if one, if one is thinking about creating them and giving you the depth of thinking um, of archives that are much older and more established. So like, it, it's a really great uh, range um, of knowledge being shared here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, back to this example specifically, I mean, this this sentence right here is kind of the starting point for the whole thing, which is why um, they're talking about querying the archive. Libraries and spaces. Libraries are spaces where language really matters. So the whole the whole article really dives into what do these words mean? How do they how do they um, include people or exclude people or include parts of society or exclude parts of the society? And what role um, these categorizations play in in the archive, which is quite interesting. Well. Sliding right on down, um, netzspannung.org, an internet platform and media art archive. So we actually have two submissions from this, um, these people, the people behind this platform. Um, Netzspannung can best be described as uh, also an early internet project. Um, and the idea was to create a platform of uh, networked catalogs of media art. Um, so the idea was to, you know, how, how, what is, how is art supposed to be preserved on the internet into the future? That was the question they were kind of asking themselves in 98. Um, and their uh, suggestion was, and, and this project was about um, literally making uh, databases or networked databases um, and directories for digital art. So um this paper also really dives into it from a very academic perspective and all the experiments that they did and where it was presented around the world and kind of the recognition that they got for it um yeah and it kind of ran its course 2010 and that's kind of where that one has left off yeah so now you can get um you can still i think you can still go to the web address but maybe it's a attached to the internet web archive um, mm -hmm. so you only get the, the more kind of face value of it you can't really interact with it uh, that much mm -hmm. anymore um, yeah and I'm some really great um, thinking and some really hard work that went into this piece here as well um, obviously really really long time ago if you think uh, to where we are now and, and the beginnings in 1970 90 or something, 1970 to, to 2010 yeah um just to say thing net spanum ran out of funding yeah that sounds about right <laughs> um thanks for that contribution um okay moving on so as i mentioned this we have two projects from them monica fleischman and david they are also the ones behind the platform um so building a knowledge space this was looking at um the archive like a living archive and archive as performance um uh what, do I, what did i write about this one yeah 
living archive that exists between physical and digital space. So they very much tried to um, have digital and physical components that they um, would bring together in these participatory spaces. Um, they, it's, that's kind of uh, what this article is about. Abdul, do you have anything to add on this one? Um, no, not so much. I mean, I mean, again, this was um, again, like really just kind of broadens out this idea that um, this actually really inspired or like made my thinking go around um, our avenues and the two persons that we interviewed because again here archive was really dismantled um, and then you know reconfigured in in um, in in doing this kind of thing where. Um, these two expressions can be um, can live together in a way, mm -hmm. um, and so the two interviews was for me it was leaning a lot into this. You know, both have digital or new media art, also uh, the community aspects. So those people that are not really so computer savvy or mm -hmm. not really even thinking about archiving, and here was a really great example of um, these these things clashing. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and then our last um, submission, uh, it's called the Shellac Archive of the Swiss Foundation. Um, this is a public domain archive of um, recordings um, that are from Shellac Records. So Shellac Records, if you're not familiar, I wasn't familiar, for example, before reading this, before getting this submission, um, were the types of records that existed before vinyl. And they're heavier and they have wider ridges. So it basically means that you can't have as much audio. Once you had vinyl, you could have more, you could have longer songs on a shellac record. It was something like four minutes on each side. Yeah. Some, of... But there was an advantage with being broader. Uh, and so quality of music maybe was slightly more amazing. Um, but you know, as technology moves on, we move on and then we dump stuff. But but here the Swiss has really taken the time to collect and make sure that this uh, music and um, uh, our oral histories are being uh, kept in a, in a certain way. Yeah, they're being preserved. So the they've done um, a, f a few different documentation projects with this. So one is documenting the physical thing. So taking photos, scans, writing, harvesting the metadata that they could get from it and kind of say, saying this is the this is what information we have about this physical thing with photos and text, but then also uh, taking the recording and digitizing it so that it's available. So it's um, it's kind of two projects, but they obviously fit together, but it also makes for a very um, interactive or and multifaceted archive, which is quite interesting. And um, yeah, since they also make this interesting point, which um, I'm sure this is the case in uh, lots of countries, the since it's a relatively old medium, most of the recordings that are on this are public domain already. Um, so it's all from you know early 1900s, um, and in those cases, that material is part of the public domain at this point, which makes the digital um, archive a lot easier to manage rights wise um, because it's all public domain, which is great. Yeah, so that's those were the submissions. Um, then we also made the decision to, or it made a lot of sense to also include in the zine um, information about the interviews that we did. Um, so the idea was to talk to a variety. I mean, one of the main points, which I guess I should have said at the beginning, was to try and highlight a variety of organizations and work that's being done in this space. Um, how we did that was we wanted to talk to a few uh, different actors in the archiving world. So we had this idea of talking to an actual archive, talking to a library, talking to a digital platform, talking to um, a technology platform. And and an event. There was also an event we wanted to talk to. We were in conversation with um, uh, we were in conversation with Documenta, um, but that evolved in a way that didn't make sense. 
Abdul can say something on that if he's up for it, but maybe not. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so our goal was to highlight a variety of organizations and the ones we ended up with are the Los Angeles Contemporary Archive, which is a small arts um, archive in Los Angeles, obviously, and Festival Imminent, which is um, a community-based festival here in Lisbon. Um, yeah, so the what I can say about the Los Angeles Contemporary Archive is they are a very small, but very innovative and creative small archive. Um, that is very focused on their local community and how, um, what kind of artists, no, that's not what I mean, what, uh, how the archive is constituted is very much based on the artists in the community and their subsequent engagement with the community. So imagine an artist organizes an exhibition, everyone that participates in the exhibition and all of the ephemera and all of the material can be given to this archive for preservation and whatever else needs to make sense for that. And the artist, um, or one thing that they talk about, um, the uh, people from the archive, one thing they talk about is that it's very much a, uh, case by case made to measure fit what the artist wants process so they do things custom they have both a physical archive and a digital archive and it's very much okay you know if you know how to do stuff online and just want to send us all the digital things go ahead if you have no idea then we'll hold your hand and really just like involve ourselves in the whole thing another thing to say about them is that they're really trying to um, change the terms of accessibility. So for them, accessibility means that they are open to the public. You can go in, anybody can go in. You, can, you don't need to be an academic. You don't need to wear gloves, these kinds of things. So they really try to make it accessible in the most physical way possible and not um, very much an open door policy. That's them. Abdul, do you want to add something? Ah, I can say um, how we came to find them. There's a, an event series in the US that is closing down called Common Field, and they have dedicated their entire archive to LACA. That's how we came to find yeah, them. Yeah, I mean, just maybe to mention that um, LACA stands, I mean, artists run and then artists engage and very much uh, involved with the community around them. And I think they placed within Chinatown um in um, Los Angeles and um they take their time <laughs> well, I mean I really enjoyed the idea that they were slowing slowing a lot of this down and um I can just give you a quick little insight because I also made some um I made some visual recording as we um uh, went through this uh, conversation. So if you, Connor, can you pin my screen? Uh, yes, but it, it looks like it's blurry. Ah, yeah, okay. I've got to change that aspect too. Um, yeah, that looks like it works. Yeah, so... <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, so um, there's a lot about this community-based aspect about it and that the artists are also really in, uh, involved in the descriptive metadata around the collection that they're taking in. Um, there's this beautiful mix between um, general aid, um, also helping out as in food, um, knowledge, or knowledge creation um, and fundraising, which is kind of also a really major part um, of the activities of, the, of, of LACA. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they bring in the complexity around um, um, things that might not be considered archival by a bigger institution, and here they are making space and place for this to happen. Um, and also just to mention that they are a node 
in a larger system connected to other um, entities around them. So they're not just a, a little island moving on their own, um, but they are within a, a, a network themselves. Yeah. And so here was just like a, a little quickie. It was like the artist drops off the artistic ephemera and eventually um, certain data reveals itself. Um, and what they really try and do with this is that like they wanna make the invisible visible. Um, lastly, we also went in the circles of just asking around um, uh, commoning or like how they like how do they keep themselves alive by having um, a means and ways of kind of working quite differently from larger institutions and um, mm -hmm. many of the people that are working there are also artists so they also have a side hustle or a few side hustles um, mm -hmm. in making this this happen um, yeah and um, at last um, this idea of deep pressures. Um, depressures this thing or this this archive like make it this accessibility came a lot around it but um, it was much more around kind of making it like not making it so prestigious or just deep pressure and um, yeah, yeah taking the glowy stuff off it and making it more available to many people yeah and then there was also was there a question can you share the image? Yeah, uh, so the the this image is in the zine and it'll be available in the report. So it'll it'll be there. Um, this is just to kind of give an, an overview. Um, then, as I mentioned, the other interview that we did was with this event series here in Lisbon called Imminent. And um, some interesting things from that conversation were this idea of ephemerality and um, a living archive. So as I said, it's an event. So every year they organize this, um, they organize this small festival, or it's not so small, they organize this festival. Um, it's focused on uh, urban culture, urban art, community-based art and participatory art. Um, it's a mix of visual arts and performance and music and dance and food. So it's a bit of everything. Um, very multifaceted um, and the questions we had were very similar so how do they like what does their archive consist of um, where is it and how do people engage with it and it started from their the like the origin of the festival so leading up to the festival there's a lot of um, community engagement so they organize various workshops to produce work for the festival whether that's sculptures or music or food or you know lots lots of different things leading up to the festival um and then that uh, then there's the festival itself which as i said um, has a lot of urban art which basically means street art on abandoned buildings and the festival takes place usually in abandoned spaces um so the art is both there until it gets covered up again by somebody else um, but it's also documented by the organizers and everybody who participates so the material that comes or the creative material that gets produced for it kind of lives in a in multiple spaces at once and um, our interviewee Margarita made this interesting point that it's that uh, all this documentation that happens um, creates is only a fragment, a fragment view of what the festival actually is. So the art that gets that remains in the space, uh, because I said it's it's street art or urban art, it stays there. Um, that's only one one view of it. That's only one perspective of it. You can't see the whole thing, and it's actually impossible to get a full um, view of the documentation and preservation that happens. The other part is that uh, it's within the people. So the people who come, they document it in their own way. They live with the experiences and sensations and take it with them. And it informs how they uh, participate or contribute in the future. So they made this point of um, a person experiences the festival in, from, from one perspective. 
and they realize their own creativity by changing their role and changing the way that they engage with it in the future. So they go from just being somebody who's viewing something to um, sharing being it widely. Well, yeah, or being commissioned by the festival. Or being commissioned. Yeah. Great work. Um, yeah, and the municipality was quite uh, uh, quite okay with this idea of the urban art pieces uh, lingering or hanging around in the city and um, a piece that was there for more than four years. Oh, no, it was I mean, a piece that got removed three years um, later and it was a car installation um, and it became very picturesque for anyone to um, like, you know, for tourists moving around the city, they could kind of get this, um, get a view into some of the urban um, art or the graffitis. Mm -hmm. um, or street arts um, that are also made um, in connection with Illuminati. So they are both, they are very aware that they don't have a very traditional archive, but they are very aware um, of um, the way the entire city and Lisbon and this particular suburb in uh, Lisbon, it's in itself is the archive. Um, and this we found very interesting and really, really invite folks to actually, if you have time for next year to go and visit the festival. Yeah. Yeah, so they had some interesting perspectives on how it, uh, yeah, the, the ephemerality of it. It's only, you know, events are fleeting. It's temporary. It's only, you're only at the event as long as it's happening. Um, and the documentation can only harvest a part of it it's impossible to actually just bottle up a festival and then put it on a shelf and open it up and see the whole thing again it's all it's always just going to be a fragment of of, of what it was um yeah so those were our um those were the interviews as i said um they yeah, maybe, maybe i'll just answer this question quickly so the the, the it wasn't a major thing with documenta but um Mm -hmm. uh, at the end, with all the controversy um, surrounding um, everything that was happening in Kassel, um, hey, Bile from Cameroon. Um, yeah, we, I mean, an invite was sent to them, but I think it was, it was, at, at the moment where they were handling quite a bit of um, the stuff that they were implicating um, the artist group in. So at the end, we, as a, I was also working quite closely with an artistic um, group. And so we thought um, to pull out and kind of not go mm -hmm. further with the document uh, archive. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe we will still kind of knock on that door again. Um, just at that moment in time, it was just too tumultuous to kind of to kind of get them to sit still with us and have a conversation about you know futuring and, and archiving in, in that in that regard. Yeah. So no, nothing too intense. It was just a matter of logistics. Yeah. And in the beginning, one thing that we spoke about was uh, archives that like how archives is, exist in a hierarchy and who has access to them and who makes the decisions and the gatekeepingness of archives what's included what's not included and this kind of stuff and as things as the festival documenta was coming to an end um, it was definitely very interesting what is going to be preserved from this moment so that, i mean it it certainly would have been an interesting conversation to have at the same time it was probably pretty clear that they weren't going to be able to engage the the hard questions about what's being preserved from it, and so it just it it didn't make sense um, to do. Um, yeah, but like Abdul said, maybe in a future iteration, it'll be interesting to see what was preserved and and what um, outlives the the festival and what doesn't. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, but yeah, that kind of brings us to the end. We're going to publish our little report about these things um, on Medium. And that's also where you'll be able to download the digital zine to check it out. And the physical zine, which we have printed, um, we are taking with to the CC Summit in the fall to Mexico City. And I've sent them to uh, our uh, director of open culture. 
Brigitte, and she is taking them to events as well as she um, represents CCA stuff around the world. So uh, with just under 17 minutes left, I open the floor to anybody's questions or comments or inquisitions. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ngozi. I mean, also just, I mean, maybe just to say is that, you know, we had, yeah, we had, um, we had a, a large variety, even with when we jumped into the project um, and with the members that were in here as well, there was, um, you know, we really wanted to dig deeper into like the, the broader aspects of this question. Um, and we did put our feelers out as far and wide as possible. We also put the invitations out as wide and far as possible. Mm -hmm. But the fish that bit is the fish that bit. Um, and I think if if we would get a you know another chance or another iteration on the same question, to maybe just try and dig a bit deeper, um, maybe we can broaden it out but i think what we've done right now is kind of giving a good sense for anyone wanting to um, endeavor into um this work and also many people's challenges is just that you know if you're working with mediums that are really ancient um it's really a very resource and money based so many of these people are just holding these archives together by peer by sheer love um, and maybe are not always so concerned about the, you know, the intellectual um, aspects of it. They're really just wanting to make sure that these things survive mm -hmm. and that they can be broadened out. So I think our hope is to be able to kind of create some sort of map um, where people can access these other types of systems. But I think this would be another iteration where we would be able to concentrate on mapping infrastructures or funding routes for these people to be able to get this back. Yeah. Um, so Rebecca, to answer your question about an overall takeaway regarding archiving of new media, my overall takeaway is that um, these organizations that are experimenting, they're not just experimenting with the specific medium itself, they're very much experimenting with the social and political like reality that the archive itself exists in so it's not just how do we save uh, a gif for forever it's like how do we save this gif that represents this community and why is it being preserved and why should it be preserved and why is it as uh worthy let's say or why should it be um collected in this way um yeah so they're they're um engaging with these things in innovative ways and trying to um you know like i said with the contemporary archive in um hello brigitte welcome <laughs> we're just wrapping up with questions um, oh hi <laughs> sorry i i could only join now no it's all good, all good. um but uh like I, so i was saying um with the los angeles contemporary archive you know they they are just opening their door to to artists and saying, you know, what is it that you want to leave behind? And what is it that we need to do in order to, to support that? And like Abdul said, it's very much a project of love, which is which is and acknowledging the absolute, absolute labor and invisible labor that goes within this work, um, because you know, everyone's got a side hustle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not as um as well funded as the documenta space, you know, for for example, that you know has a, a almost five year running uh, budget to make sure that things get kept in certain ways. Um, and I think this was very interesting for us as well as just to kind of have this, uh, or our attempt at having this kind of spectrum, um, and um, by keeping the door open as long as we could, we got what we got. Um, but definitely there could be space for an iteration. Mm -hmm. There could be you know, a deeper look, a deeper analysis into um, folks or organizations or associations that have these special 
uh, mediums or materials that we make we make certain avenues for them to get to spaces of being able to archive them or also maybe just putting them in touch with um, technologists that can maybe help them in in transferring the data or because again you know these things are all very resource based and also medium specific you will need a computer from the 1980s or from the early 1990s to be able to run a floppy disk, you know, and so where do you get these things? Mm -hmm. um, with our, the way our world is going, these things are always pushed out of your house, you know, so we need institutions to be able to kind of hold onto them or organizations or associations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also to touch on the new media thing a little bit, one question we had, or I had with, with Eminent was like, are there other archives that exist that are, that are trying to preserve street art? Is that something that even exists somewhere else? And they basically said, we have no idea, but we don't think so. And it's, you know, it's it street art is something that I think basically the whole world engages with in different ways, um, you know, and at different levels. Um, but how is it preserved and how is it how is it collected and what does it mean that it existed in a certain pace and what does the ephemerality mean? Um, it's a very, very interesting question. And that's, you know, you can you can basically say street art is cave painting, but you can also say street art is um, the protest uh, graffiti about gentrification in my neighborhood, you know, and how that how that is from a curational perspective is also interesting who how because the photos of the cave paintings are preserved in a museum and an archive but this other thing that's not wildly different in all the you know things is not and why and that was a very interesting sort of conversation to have with them that it's you know it needs to be preserved and needs to be looked at and, and examined and questioned and brought into a contemporary reality yeah, I'm just looking at Zed Blaze's uh, comment that the net spannung is so problematic. Um, yeah, enlighten us. <laughs> you want to say some more, Antje? Yeah, I mean, you did mention earlier in uh, that there was very top down, and then eventually uh, funding ran out. Um, the article also writes off record. Oh, for sure. Okay, no worries. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, but I think what was really great by getting that article is also just kind of having a lesson in um, in seeing how these very good intentions are maybe set up and then the realities of, um, of it changing slightly. And I think this is what, what these articles are really pointing out to us. I mean, they're not, you know, blaming anyone within it, but I think they're just pointing out to us that there is certain means and ways that one would have to go about setting these things up because it, you know it's it's pre the, the preservation is not just for one grouping it is really to look at um a, 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 a larger a larger no for sure understandable um a larger um grouping of people mm -hmm. um but yeah i think that's what we could do um, in the time that we have. Um, I think this platform would have definitely have to consider making iterations of each one of the themes that were maybe looked at mm -hmm. um, because these are not really dead end conversations. I think we maybe just kind of lifted one layer of it and there's uh, many layers to kind of still delve into. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the, the zine and the report and these interviews, it's kind of like pointing at examples. It's not really, uh, yeah, there's, there's another layer that, that can come with another um, working group focused on this or, um, you know, some other kind of conversation, but it's, these are examples. These are um, interesting contributions and, um, and yeah. So if we don't have any other questions from our um, group here, I would say we can wrap it up. I will give us very special thanks to Creative Commons for the support and for the network, um, to all of our group members who contributed in the beginning to kind of set the frame for what we're working with, um, and to Abdul, thank you so much for working with me on this. It's always great. <laughs> yeah, and also just thanks to everyone's energy and their messages of saying that they're busy, and you know these all helps in kind of keeping one's morale up. 
jumping mm. into the middle of a project and you know trying to still see it through so okay. big thanks and um no worries the last three years has been heavy and tumultuous for many of us anyway so um you know just a contribution by saying hello was super amazing in the time that we were putting this together so thanks yeah. so much for that yeah and i'm just going to check if they're here yeah um so they not neither of them joined but also a big thanks to to the people that we interviewed it was um yeah. you know it was oh, great yeah. to, to make the time to to talk to us and give us so much insight we did have very long conversations it was more than an hour each time so it was you know a chunk of time for them that they had to prepare for so we're really grateful for them and their insight into the into the work that they do it's been it's been great then um yeah i'll just leave it at that um thank you guys so much and uh, happy new year i guess i'm still allowed to say that maybe for two more days yeah two uh, more days yeah. <laughs> once the 15th rolls around i'll stop saying happy new year um yeah thank you everybody and have a great rest of your week and hope to see you again soon maybe just answer the question around this conversation being published where will be attached to this um to the medium article uh, where's this question? Uh, Z Z Blaze is asking this again. Conversation recording. Yeah, but it's attached to. Did you plan to publish uh, this, this? This recording goes yeah. to Creative Commons. Yes, they'll have it. I don't know if there's a there's a plan to publish the. I, I can answer that, Connor. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the idea is that uh, we'll make all these recordings. Uh, available. I think that uh, it's a super valuable resource to get back to when for people who couldn't join, but also for people who, um, you know, might be interested further down the line. So we'll have a um, a blog post on the Creative Commons blog that will summarize the work of all the working groups. There were, yeah, there are five, uh, six in total. Um, we'll have a link to all your outputs, all your creations, and to this webinar. So stay tuned for this in a in a couple of weeks. Perfect. I guess that answers that question. Um, yeah, that was the only question. Left. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> uh, all the best. Have a cracker over here. Yeah. Hope to see you around soon. Bye. Tschüss. Bye. <laughs>